Chapter 8 of Among the Night People by Clara Dillingham Pearson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 8 The Night Moth's Party. From the time when she was a tiny golden green caterpillar, Miss Polyphemus had wanted to go into society. She began life on a maple leaf with a few brothers and sisters, who hatched at the same time from a cluster of flattened eggs which their mother had laid there ten days before. The first thing she remembered was the light and color and sound when she broke the shell open that May morning. The first thing she did was to eat the shell out of which she had just crawled. Then she got acquainted with her brothers and sisters, many of whom had also eaten their eggshells, although two had begun at once on maple leaves. It was well that she took time for this now, for the family were soon scattered, and several of her sisters she never saw again. She found it a very lovely world to live in. There was so much to eat. Yes, and there were so many kinds of leaves that she liked. Oak, hickory, apple, maple, elm, and several others. Sometimes she wished that she had three mouths instead of one. In those days she had few visitors. It is true that other caterpillars happened along once in a while, but they were almost as hungry as she, and they couldn't speak without stopping eating. They could, of course, if they talked with their mouths full, but she had too good manners for that, and besides, she said that if she did, she couldn't enjoy her food so much. You must not think it was wrong in her to care so much about eating. She was only doing what is expected of a polyphemous caterpillar, and you would have to do the same if you were a polyphemus caterpillar. When she was ten days old, she had to weigh ten times as much as she did the morning that she was hatched. When she was twenty days old, she had to weigh sixty times as much. When she was a month old, she had to weigh six hundred and twenty times as much. And when she was fifty days old, she had to weigh four thousand as much as she did at hatching. Every bit of this flesh was made of the food she ate. That is why eating was so important, you know, and if she had chosen to eat the wrong kind of leaves just because they tasted good, she would never have become such a fine great caterpillar as she did. She might better not eat anything than to eat the wrong sort, and she knew it. Still, she often wished that she had more time for visiting, and thought that she would be very gay next year when she got her wings. I'll make up for it then, she said to herself, when my growing is done and I have time for play. Then she ate some more good plain food, for she knew that there would be no happy moth times for caterpillars who did not eat as they should. She had five vacations of about a day each, when she ate nothing at all. These were the times when she changed her skin, crawling out of the tight old one and appearing as fresh and clean as possible in the new one, which was ready underneath. After her last change, she was ready to plan her cocoon, and she was a most beautiful caterpillar. She was about as long as a small cherry leaf and as plump as a caterpillar can be. She was light green, with seven slanting yellow lines on each side of her body, and a purplish-brown V-shaped mark on the back of each side. There were many little orange-colored bunches on her body, which showed beautiful gleaming lights when she moved. Growing out of these bunches were tiny tufts of bristles. She had three pairs of real legs and several pairs of make-believe ones. Her real legs were on the front part of her body and were slender. These she expected to keep always. The make-believe ones were called pro-legs. They grew farther back and were fat, awkward, jointless things, which she would not need after her cocoon was spun. But for them she would have had to drag the back part of her body around like a snake. With them the back part of her body could walk as well as the front although not quite so fast. She always took a few steps with her real legs and then waited for her pro-legs to catch up. As the weather grew colder, 
the polyphemus caterpillar hunted around on the ground for a good place for her cocoon she found an excellent twig lying among the dead leaves and decided to fasten to that then began her hardest work spinning a fluffy mass of gray-white silk which clung to the twig and to one of the dry leaves and was almost exactly the color of the leaf other caterpillars came along and stopped to visit for they did not have to eat at cocoon spinning time better fasten your cocoon to a tree said a pale bluish green promethea caterpillar put it inside a curled leaf like mine and wind silk around the stem to strengthen it then you can swing every time the wind blows and the silk will keep the leaf from wearing out but i don't want to swing answered the polyphemus caterpillar i'd rather lie still and think about things fasten to the twig of a tree advised a pale green cecropia caterpillar with red yellow and blue bunches then the wind just moves you a little fasten to a twig and taper it off nicely at each end and then yes said the polyphemus caterpillar and then the blue jays and chickadees will poke wheat or corn or beech nuts into the upper end of it i don't care to turn my sleeping room into a corn cob just here some other polyphemus caterpillars came along and agreed with their relative go ahead with your tree homes said they we know what we want and we'll see next summer who knew best the polyphemus cocoons were spun on the ground where the dead leaves had blown in between some stones and no wandering cows or sheep would be likely to step on them first a mass of coarse silk which it took half a day to make then an inside coating of a kind of varnish then as much silk as a caterpillar could spin in four or five days next another inside varnishing and the cocoons were done as the polyphemus caterpillars snuggled down for the long winter's sleep each said to himself something like this those poor caterpillars in the trees how cold they will be i hope they may come out all right in the spring but i doubt it very much and when the cecropia and promethea caterpillars dozed off for the winter they said what a pity that those polyphemus caterpillars would lie around on the ground well we advised them what to do so it isn't our fault they all had a lovely winter and swung or swayed or lay still just as they had chosen to do early in the spring the farmer's wife and little girl came out to find wild flowers and scraped the leaves away from among the stones out rolled the cocoon that the first polyphemus caterpillar had spun and the farmer's wife picked it up and carried it off she might have found more cocoons if the little girl had not called her away this is how it happened that one may morning a little girl stood by the sitting-room window in the white farmhouse and watched miss polyphemus crawl slowly out of her cocoon a few days before a sour milky looking stuff had begun to trickle into the lower end of the cocoon softening the hard varnish and the soft silken threads until a tiny doorway was opened now all was ready and miss polyphemus pushed out she was very wet and weak and forlorn oh said she to herself it is more fun to be a new caterpillar than it is to be a new moth i've only six legs left and it will be very hard worrying along on these i shall have to give up walking it was discouraging you can see how it would be she had been used to having so many legs and had looked forward all the summer before to the time when she should float lightly through the air and sip honey from flowers she had dreamed of it all winter and now here she was wet and weak with only six legs left and four very small and crumpled wings her body was so big and fat that she could not hold it up from the window sill she wanted to cry it was all so sad and disappointing she would have done so had she not remembered how very unbecoming it is to cry when she remembered that she decided to take a nap instead and that was a most sensible thing to do for crying always makes matters worse while sleeping makes them better when she awakened she felt much stronger and more cheerful 
She was drier, and her body felt lighter. This was because the fluids from it were being pumped into her wings. That was making them grow, and the beautiful colors began to show more brightly on them. I wonder, she said to herself, if moths always feel so badly when they first come out. If she had but known it, there were at that very time hundreds of moths as helpless as she, clinging to branches, leaves, and stones all through the forest. There were many polyphemus moths just out, for in their family it is the custom for all to leave their cocoons at just about such a time in the morning. Perhaps she would have felt more patient if she had known this, for it does seem to make hard times easier to bear when one knows that everybody else has hard times also. Of course, other people always are having trouble, but she was young and really believed for a time that she was the only uncomfortable moth in the world. All day long her wings were stretching and growing smooth. When it grew dark she was nearly ready to fly. Then the farmer's wife lifted her gently by the wings and put her on the inside of the wire window screen. When the lights in the house were all put out, the moonbeams shone in on Miss Polyphemus and showed her beautiful sand-colored body and wings with the dark border on the front pair and the lighter border on the back pair. On the back ones were dark eye spots with clear places in the middle, through which one could see quite clearly. I would like to fly, sighed Miss Polyphemus, and I believe I could if it were not for this horrid screen. She did not know that the farmer's wife had put her there to keep her safe from night birds until she was quite strong. The wind blew in, sweet with the scent of wild cherry and shad tree blossoms, and poor Miss Polyphemus looked over toward the forest where she had lived when she was a caterpillar, and wished herself safely there. Much good it does me to have wings when I cannot use them, said she. I want something to eat. There is no honey to be sucked out of wire netting. I wish I were a happy caterpillar again, eating leaves on the trees. She was not the first moth who has wished herself a caterpillar, but she soon changed her mind. There fluttered toward her another polyphemus moth, a handsome fellow, marked exactly as she was, only with darker coloring. His body was more slender, and his feelers were very beautiful and feathery. She was fat and had slender feelers. Ah, said he, I thought I should find you soon. Indeed, she replied, I wonder what made you think that. My feelers, of course, said he. They always tell me where to find my friends. You know how that is yourself. I, said she, as she changed her position a little, I am just from my cocoon. This was my coming out day. And so you have not met anyone yet? he asked. Ah, this is a strange world, a very strange world. I would advise you to be very careful with whom you make friends. There are so many bad moths, you know. Good evening, said a third voice near them, and another polyphemus moth with feathery feelers alighted on the screen. He smiled sweetly at Miss Polyphemus and scowled fiercely at the other moth. It might have ended in a quarrel right then and there, if a fourth moth had not come at that minute. One after another came, until there were nine handsome fellows on the outside, and Miss Polyphemus on the inside of the screen, trying to entertain them all and keep them all from quarreling. It made her very proud to think so many were at her coming out party. Still, she would have enjoyed it better, she thought, if some whom she'd known as caterpillars could be there to see how much attention she was having paid to her. There was one caterpillar whom she had never liked. She only wished that she could see her now. Still, society tires one very much, and it was hard to keep her guests from quarreling. When she got to talking with one about maple trees, another was sure to come up and say that he had always preferred beech when he was a caterpillar. And the two outside would glare at each other while she hastily thought of something to say. At last, those outside got to fighting. There was only one, the handsomest of all, who said he thought too much of his feelers to fight anybody. Supposing I should fight and break them off, said he. I couldn't smell a thing for the rest of my life. 
He was very sensible, and really the eight other fellows were fighting on account of Miss Polyphemus, for whenever they thought she liked one best, they began to bump up against him. Toward morning, the farmer's wife awakened and looked at Miss Polyphemus. When she saw that she was strong enough to fly, she opened the screen and let her go. By that time, three of those with feathery feelers were dead. Three were broken-winged and clinging helplessly to the screen, and two were so busy fighting that they didn't see Miss Polyphemus go. The handsome great fellow who did not believe in fighting went with her, and they lived in the forest after that. But she never cared for society again. End of chapter 8